Okay, right. Uh, this talk isn't as well prepared as I would like, um, but uh, we'll we'll just see how it goes. The other thing uh, I'll say as a as a preamble is uh, I sometimes have a tendency to use terminology that other people don't quite understand or take for granted certain things that people might not find clear. So um, I'm happy to be interrupted with clarificatory questions. Do try and save any larger questions to the end, but please just stick your hand up if you want something clarifying. Um, right, so. That said, um, the title of my talk, uh, somewhat controversially, is Only the Death of God Can Save Us. Um, and there's a, a sort of implicit reference here to two philosophers. One is Nietzsche, uh, who famously coined this idea of the death of God, and who said, oh, in the words of the mouth of, of, uh, of one of his characters, God is dead and we have killed him. Um, and um, Martin Heidegger, uh, who, despite being an, a, a, a devotee of Nietzsche, uh, famously in one of his later interviews, gave this this phrase, only a, only a god can save us. Um, and I, um, so I want to kind of argue implicitly against Heidegger here that, in fact, not only is it the case that, that it's false that only a god can save us, but in fact only the death of god can save us. There's a certain sense in which the ethical life is only possible, truly possible, under the condition of atheism. This is a controversial position, but I'll present my argument for it. Right, um, to give you a little bit of additional background, um, Nietzsche and Heidegger are very useful for framing what I'm going to talk about, because both of them provided uh, an analysis of the nature of theism. Um, and uh, each of them um, presented... Uh, a corresponding crisis for theistic philosophy. So with, with Nietzsche, Nietzsche um, diagnosed the um, uh, theism in terms of what he called ascetic ideals, which are like fundamental ideals upon which all of our other systems of value are based. And he did this in The Genealogy of Morality, which is a fantastic book that everybody should read. Um, and he, he also diagnosed the crisis, which was what he called nihilism. Um, nihilism was the, the, the state of affairs in Europe that he saw coming about, which was um, the implicit rejection of theism as the basis of our system of values without any kind of replacement, um, leading to a certain kind of lapse of value as such. Um, so Nietzsche, sometimes people get confused with Nietzsche and think that Nietzsche is a nihilist. Nietzsche is not a nihilist. Nietzsche, Nietzsche diagnosed nihilism as, as a problem. Um, with Heidegger, um, Heidegger's analysis of, of theism is, a, is, is principally about metaphysics rather than ethics. And he diagnosed what he called ontotheology, which was uh, his understanding of the way in which God or similar principles had structured our metaphysical thinking about nature and, and the universe. Um, and he, he, the crisis that he diagnosed is what he called the end of metaphysics. So he, he actually identified metaphysics with on theology, and he thought we had to move beyond metaphysics itself. I, I don't think that's the case, but, but he, he definitely diagnosed some kind of crisis. Um, so as I say, there's, there's two dimensions um, of theism I'm going to look at, um, uh, an, an ethical dimension and a metaphysical dimension, but I'm going to focus on the ethical. Um, so um, one additional caveat I'm going to put forward is... I think it's incredibly important to define theism. Um, I, I think definition is what philosophy is principally about. I'm Socratic in this. You know, Socrates walks around saying, you know, what is justice? What is this, that, and the other? Uh, and I think this is incredibly important. And the reason it's important is because theism claims to make very important claims about A, how we should understand the world, metaphysics, and B, how we should live in it, ethics. Um, and you can only make these kinds of claims on the basis of a thorough understanding of the commitment that defines theism, which is namely the existence of the divine. And I'm, I'm going to talk about the divine rather than God because I want my description of theism to capture polytheism and monotheism and pantheism and all forms of theism. Um, and the thing is, is that, I mean, it has been suggested to me before, and I think this was suggested at the last talk, that um, God might just be this sort of family resemblance concept. This is a Wittgensteinian idea. It might just be this 
this concept that connects a few different ideas, but there's no central essence to it. And my counter to that is, if that is the case, then theism is at best irrelevant and at worst actively confusing. Um, the only way in which the theism can have any positive effect is if it is effectively defined. Um, and so I'm arguing against um, people who have a, a fixed position, not people who don't know what their position is. Um, right. Okay. Um, now, the, the core dualism that's going to organise the discussion I'm going through is the distinction between theoretical and practical reason. So, between thinking about what is and thinking about what ought to be. Um, or, and I'll, I'll put this as a caveat, when I talk about what ought to be, really I'm talking about what we ought to do. Uh, there's a whole additional discussion you could have about the relation between those two things, but I'm just going to talk about what ought, ought to be, um, because it, it sounds better. Um, I also need to make clear what I understand by reason here. Um, and some people have a tendency to use the term rationality um, in terms of content rather than form. So what I mean by that is some people will say, you know, someone comes up on the street and says, there are, there are aliens on the moon monitoring our thoughts. And you say, oh, that's, that's irrational. It's not, but strictly speaking, it's not irrational. Because irrational, irration, rationality isn't about the content of someone's beliefs, it's about how they justify them. So if, if they have that belief and they have one that's incompatible with it, like aliens don't exist, then they're being irrational, right? Um, principally what rationality is about or reason is about is inferential connections, right? Being able to draw the inferential connections and the consequences of the beliefs we hold. Um, um, and the distinction between theoretical and practical rationality uh, is about the difference between um, justifying our beliefs and working out their consequences and justifying how we should act and uh, the, the maxims govern governing the ways we act. Um, now, the other thing I need to make clear is that there are different species of theoretical and practical reasoning. It's not ju that's not the only division you can make within reasoning. Um, so, against certain neo-positivists, I have in mind people like Richard Dawkins here, there is more to theoretical reasoning than natural science. Right? There is more to, 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 to reasoning about the way the world is than simple natural science. And that's a, a claim I can justify elsewhere, but, what I, but my commitment is that there's also at least metaphysical reasoning, which would be met reasoning about the fundamental concepts which underlie our natural scientific descriptions of the world. So what is essence? What is causation? What is, you know, these big what is questions which actually underlie science. Um, so that's my commitment against sort of neo-positivism and against, and I'll, I'll just uh, put this under the, the, the heading of neoclassical economics. Against neoclassical economics, there is more to practical reasoning than instrumental reasoning. So instrumental reasoning is reasoning about how we should do what we already think we should do. So, you know, I, I, I want to make a million pounds. How do I go about it? Like that's, that's instrumental reasoning. Um, and uh, 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 rationality has often been associated because of neoclassical e economics, and particularly the strains which are dependent on rational choice theory. Rationality has been associated with instrumental reasoning. So there's nothing more to... to to, to, to practical reasoning than, than working out how we achieve our, or maximise our preferences. I think that's disastrous. Um, there's also at least um, reasoning about normative principles that govern us all, which is to say arguments about what we should do, not just how we do it. Um, so um, the, the, th the, the reason I bring this up is that theism has historically dominated both of these domains. And so what you can see with uh, what I've called neo-positivism and neoclassical, the sort of rough neoclassical economic thinking, is actually they reject theism, but in rejecting the theism, they reject the domains themselves, rather than trying to provide an alternative to theism within those spaces. They actually cut off those bits of, of rationality, which I think is, is really, really harmful. So it's, it's, it's an overreaction. Um, uh, and I'll explain what it's an overreaction to. Um, so, um, getting back into it, I, I, 
to define theism, I think it's a conjunction of two distinct positions. One ethical and one met met metaphysical. So uh, on the, the strictly metaphysical side, there's a position I'll call deism, which uh, some people might know about, and because uh, it's, a, it's a quite standard term. And on the ethical side, I'm going to coin this term psychism, um, and I'll explain what both of these mean. But uh, before I kind of provide definitions of these, um, it's helpful to say what I think they both share in common, which is I, I both think that what they do is try and, and I'll use a bit of te technical terminology here, I think they, they both try to mediate a tautology that's pe uh, peculiar to theoretical or practical reason. Um, and for those of you who don't know what a tautology is, a tautology is simply a truth that is true in virtue of its form. So, a very simple example, all red things are red, right? That, that can't be false, and it can't be false because of the form it takes. That's a tautology. And I, I think there's a, um, two <coughs> interesting tautologies. Um, on the one hand, what is, is, right? And on the other hand, what ought to be, ought to be, right? These are the kind of core defining tautologies of theoretical and practical reason. And I think that what, what deism and psychism do is to try and mediate these tautologies, to provide some, some reason why what actually is, is, and what actually ought to be, actually ought to be. Um, so, um, um, I'll say that, um, so, although both of these truths are strictly, strictly trivial, I think the sheer scope of what they talk about, i.e. everything that is or everything that ought to be, um, can tempt us into seeking some single reason why everything is the way it actually is, um, and not another way. Um, so I'll call these global challenges because they seek an ultimate reason for everything in the relevant domain, be it theoretical or practical. Um, now, these are distinct from local challenges, which seek specific reasons for why we think something specific is, or why we think something specific ought to be. Um, now, now that I've put that, I'll, I'll actually present some definitions of, um, of deism and, uh, and psychism. So, first of all, um, we can define deism is anything that tries to answer the global challenge regarding what there is by positing some privileged entity or some group of entities that are the metaphysical ground of what is. Um, so, you know, God as a first cause, like Aristotle would say, is a good example of deism. Right? God is that thing which explains why everything is that it is because he designed the universe this way. Right? Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a whole range of positions that you could incorporate here. <laughs> Importantly, although the, the Aristotelian conception involves this very much temporal idea of God comes before everything, uh, you don't need to do it in that way. You can, you can talk about what we would call imminent causation rather than just efficient causation. And so Spinoza would be a very good idea here. Um, so the Spinozistic idea would be, well, you'd ask, well, not why is this thing on the table here, and then you trace back the causes back to God, but you say rather something like, why is Boyle's law the way it is? Well, Boyle's law the way it is, is the way it is for, so, for something to do with the essence of God, right? It's not about something happening at the beginning, but it's about the, the nature of reality. Um, now, um, moving on to psychism, it's a bit more hard to find. I'll define it as any it uh, psychism. Yes. Uh, P S Y C H I S M. Right. So psyche, in Greek for mind. Um, yeah. We can define psychism as anything that tries to answer the global challenge regarding what ought to be by positing some intentional principle um, or set of principles that function as the ethical ground of what ought to be. I use this word intentional there, and I'm going to have to uh, spell that out. The reason I call this position <laughs> psychism. So essentially what it tries to do is see some mental thing within the world 
as providing the ground for for the normative, i.e., what we should do, right? So the classic thing is, you know, God commands us, right? But God can only command us because we view him as some kind of mental thing, even if even if we view him as being completely different in his mental attributes than than ours, we still have to understand them in intentional terms. Um, and and so I think anything which tries to use the way we understand how each other works in intentional terms to ground um, its ethical system is a form of psychism. Um, right. Um, now, as I said at the beginning, I think theism is the combination of these positions, such that the entity which grounds everything and the, the principle which underlies all ethics ultimately become the same thing. So be it God or the gods or you know, um, Brahman or, or whatever you want to, to identify, or even Nietzsche being Nietzsche and the will to power, right? Um, um, uh, both become <coughs> the, the ground of theoretical and practical reason. Um, it is possible to have these positions separately. Um, you can just be a deist, and I think Spinoza is a good example, um, and you can just, well, in a certain sense, uh, and you can actually just be a psychist. So, uh, uh, and the only example I can think of here is a philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas, who famously argues that that God is beyond being. <laughs> so, like, God is too good for metaphysics, you know, so you, you, you have to, but he, he still conceives God in roughly intentional terms as the basis of ethics. And um, some of what Mike was suggesting last week might have, might also be seen as a form of psychism without without deism, an attempt to sort of construct a god as some kind of ethical principle or whatever. But we'll talk about that later. Um, now, the role that theism plays in both cases is to permit particular kinds of explanation and to exclude other kinds of explanation, right? So, and this is, as I say, on the one hand, theoretical forms of explanation, and on the other, practical forms of, well, you'd say justification rather than explanation. Um, so it's all about the kinds of reasons we're allowed to give. Um, so here's some examples. Um, uh, we, won we won the battle because the gods were on our side. That's a causal explanation of an event within the world, right? Um, uh, and the kind of implicit thing there is, maybe if we do the same things we were doing before, you know, sacrificing and whatever, we'll win the next battle because the gods will be on our side then too. Um, um, this is virtuous because Hercules did it, or Heracles did it, right? That's an example of a kind of practical justification which appeals to the divine, you know? This is good, because the stories say the divine, or an instance of the divine, did this. Um, so that's that's a kind of positive form of explanation. Uh, I'm also going to provide two examples of um, excluding of certain kinds of explanation. So here's a classic. God moves in mysterious ways, right? Why did this happen? Well, you know, you can't say. God moves in mysterious ways. Um, he, he, he is beyond our ken. Um, and an example in the practical domain, you cannot presume to judge, only God can judge, right? That's an example of a, a, a kind of blocking of practical justification. Um, now, this is essentially the difference between what you might call positive and negative theology, right? And Virtually nothing is fully positive or fully negative. There's some kind of blending of these throughout history. But roughly, positive theology is the allowing of positive explanations, be they theoretical or practical, on the basis of some ultimate reason, some ultimate ground. Um, and negative theology is the exclusion of certain kinds of um, theoretical or practical explanations on the basis of an ultimate ground. Right? Um, and as I say, even like the most negative theological positions, like, I mean, it's very, very much associated with Judaism, with a lot of Judaistic, um, um, approaches. So like Levinas is a good example of a, a very radical negative theologian. 
even there, there is a side of tacit assumption that God might be entirely beyond our ken, but he's still good, he's still benevolent, or there's still some sense in which he's linked to the ethical. And that is, that is you know, a kind of certain retreat from, from the radicality of, of, of the unknowability of God. Anyway, we can talk about that later. Um, now, I think this already suggests the problem with theism that I'm going to put forward, insofar as it impedes the demands for proper reasons regarding the specific causes of events within the world and the justifications of specific actions in the world. Um, basically, I think theism, in all of its forms, ultimately licenses bad forms of argumentation. Right? That's my, my, my central kind of tenet. Right? If you get rid of theism, everything is open to proper challenge in the theoretical and the practical domains. But we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more. Um, now, I'm not going to go into Heidegger's argument against the metaphysical side of theism. He does have an argument. If anybody wants to ask me about it, feel free. But I'm going to focus on the ethical dimension. And more so... Although there is plenty I could say about Nietzsche's sort of sociological analysis of the aesthetic ideal, as I said before, I think it's really good. Um, um, I actually think there's a much better analysis of the problems uh, of theism, and I find that in Plato on the one hand and Kierkegaard on the other. And I'll go into each of them. So, um, taking Plato first, um, because, well, you know, as Whitehead famously says, the history of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Uh, the more the more I read, the more I realise this is the case. So, um, um, Plato presents what I take to be the fundamental takedown of the ethical dimension of theism uh, in the Euthyphro, and this is nearly two thousand five hundred years old. So, um, um, if you if you you side with Nietzsche, God has been dead for a lot longer than <laughs> than even Nietzsche thought. It's just we haven't realised it yet. Um, um, now. I'm going to simplify Plato's argument, um, um, but it's essentially focused around this challenge that he poses to theists. <laughs> is the good good because God commands it, or does God command it because it's good? Right? That is one of the most simple and effective philosophical challenges in the history of philosophy, if not the most. Right? Um, it's staggering in its beautiful simplicity, right? Now, the crucial idea that we get out of this is that the essence of the good, what distinguishes it from other forms of norm, um, um, so, for instance, from etiquette, you know, etiquette dictates that there are certain ways you should hold your fork at a dinner party, you know, um, or fashion, which you know, dictates that you should wear certain clothes at certain seasons of the year. What distinguishes the good from either of these kinds of norm and from all the varieties of different kinds of norm we can come up with um, is not only that it trumps all of the forms of norm. You know, when, when push comes to shove, you ignore the dictates of, ethic, uh, of, of etiquette and fashion in favour of ethical demands. Right? Not only is it that, but this very fact means that it transcends any commandment we could be given, be it by God or anyone else. And this is, a, uh, this is related to some extent to Kant's idea of autonomy. And Kant, who was a religious man himself, recognised that even if the Almighty comes down to you and says, do this, you do not do so without a good reason. Right? Uh, but anyway, moving on from Kant, because I could get stuck there. Um, the point is that we should be able to argue any claims as to what we should do above all else, because that's what the good is. The good is what we should do above all else, right? Um, we should be able to argue about that um, regardless. And that means we should even be able to argue with God. And if we were to have an argument with God about what we should do in the last instance, right, what we would be doing is we'd be arguing with God in the name of the good. We'd be placing the good above him, right? Regardless of how you conceive it. Um, so, 
that's the, the real platonic gesture, is the good transcends the divine. Um, now, um, this is the same point that is picked up by Kierkegaard, but from another direction. Um, Kierkegaard, if everybody knows who he was, a famous Danish philosopher, studied under Hegel, um, and he wrote several great books, but the one I'm going to refer to is a book called Fear and Trembling, in which he dramatises the myth of Abraham and Isaac. Um, and his big, big argument with Hegel is he Hegel famously argued that there could be such a thing as rational faith, and Kierkegaard took issue on this point. And Kierkegaard wasn't an atheist, Kierkegaard was, was a, a theist, but he felt that there is something about faith which makes it intrinsically irrational, and he picks up this from the perspective of, well, he doesn't refer to Plato, but it's essentially the same point. What he, what he says and what he shows <coughs> through his attempt to dramatise this, this you know, myth of uh, where, you know, to repeat the story, God demands of Abraham that he sacrifice Isaac to him. And this is a, the whole point is this is a obviously unethical action. God demands that Abraham does something unethical. And Abraham, because he is what Peter God calls the knight of faith, the man with true faith in the Almighty, right, he goes along with it until God calls him off. But forgetting about the calling off bit, right, what Kierkegaard asks is, how do we understand Abraham? How can we understand his reasons for what he does? And he tries to tell the myth from various different directions, and he ultimately comes to the conclusion, Abraham is incomprehensible. Abraham is irrational. Because there is no way of arguing with Abraham about the good. Because Abraham has subordinated the good to God. And this means that fundamentally the whole edifice of practical reasoning that we could engage Abraham with has been shut off. Right? Um, and so, you know, Kate God says Abraham is irrational. And he thinks this is fine. He, he thinks the night of faith is amazing. That, that the night of faith is able to do this is a good thing. I disagree, <laughs> but he 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 gets it he gets it right. Um, so um, taking off that point, I'll just draw to a close. My controversial conclusion is that we can only truly live an ethical life, and I mean that in the sense of being sincere. We can only be sincerely ethical, completely and fully, right? if we reject theism, right? Or at the very least, reject the ethical dimension of it, right? There are independent arguments against deism, but this is the argument against the ethical side, right? And this is because the good must be unmediated. The good is the good. It's not the good because of anything. It is simply is, right? Um, and this means that there needs to be no limits to the challenges we can make within the, the domain of practical reasoning. We must always be able to challenge, we must always be able to call people to account in the name of the good. And God should, or any kind of divine principle, should never be able to stop us. Um, so, instead of looking for a single principle, which is the ultimate reason for all ethical claims, we must instead understand the structure of specific ethical reasons, right? We have to understand what the structure of practical rationality is itself, and from that we will understand what the good is. And to put a little, that's essentially Kant's position, and I think Kant is fundamentally right there. And I disagree with what he claims specifically about. I don't think categorical imperative is right, but I think the good is to be found within the structure of reason rather than in any metaphysical claim we could hope to make. So, finally, in essence, to champion practical reason itself is what it is to champion the good rather than any divine you know, principle. And that's it.
Yeah, excellent, Pete. Thank you. Hey, I've got a exactly 30, 30 minutes. minutes. Exactly 30 minutes. We I'm negotiated really on the phone. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I have some additional subtopics to discuss, but uh, but Andy is going to... It will come yeah. via Andy's questions. If okay. everyone is okay, <laughs> Andy concentrated hard. <laughs> well, that was me trying not to panic, basically. <laughs> yes, yes. Find a contradiction in that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my god, even. Um, Further first. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for that. It was fantastic. Great. Really, really great to see that sort of incisive analysis of things like that. So uh, that was very much appreciated. Um, now, I've been writing questions as I go along here, and the first questions are sort of more superficial. And then the later ones are sort of like, I'm trying to get to the point of it, which is not easy. I don't know which way to go with it, really. Um, I'll, tr I'll start with the, with, the, with the silly ones I thought of first. Um, now, you, you mentioned early on that you felt that theistic thinking was in some way harmful, that you felt there was something wrong with it. So are you, it, it suggests to me that you feel there's a sort of, there's a need, there's a necessity to find something there, to, to search for something which brings this idea down. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, I, what I've got to say is I'm not sort of rather yeah. the anti-theist. I just think yeah. theism is wrong. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I think I can prove theism is yeah. wrong. And I think that most theists are perfectly reasonable and most theists engage in practical reasoning yeah. perfectly well. It's the fact that what worries me is the fact that they always have this card in their back pocket that they can pull out at any time yeah. and say, ah, the debate stops. Yes. And I think that's, that's what... So it's rightness and wrongness that you're, you're, you're concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I think... And, 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 and most good theists... Because there are yeah. demonstrably good theists. Most good theists do not play that card. Yes. Uh, it's, I just want to make sure no one can play it. So it's axiomatic... Yes. with you, that yeah. rightness and wrongness, it's necessary that it be defended. It, we need yeah. it. Why? Why do you need it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, again, as much as anything else, it's about truth. I mean, I think, truth. you know, you can you can argue about whether you think, you know, religion is useful mm. or this, that, or the other. And I think there are very interesting yes. arguments to be had there. But brass tacks, it's yes. false. So you could say, then, that truth and rightness and wrongness are sacred to you, would you say? Um... Are they sacred? They're more important than sacred. <laughs> they're, you know, like, I, I couldn't, like, you could, you know, we could we could use the word sacred to define all kinds of different things, and I would yes. say truth is more important than all of them. Self-evidently, truth is self-evidently the ultimate thing. It's not even about evidence. I mean, it's, it's, it really isn't it's, about, it's, it's about, look, I mean, regardless of anything else you want to think about, yeah. anything else you want to work out what we yeah. should do in the world, right? You yeah. need to be interested in truth. You need to have the correct truth, premises. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, I, yes. and I'm not going to get into debates about whether, you know, someone could put a gun in my father's head and say, you know, tell a lie! Because obviously I think there are cases yes. like so that we can analyse. But, but there's a necessity, the feeling of necessity there. Yes. I mean, well, and it's, not, it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It just is the necessity. It's a fact as far as you're concerned. Depending on how we use that word. But it's, 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 it's an obligation. Yes. So going back to feeling, then you, you're speaking about reasons for believing. Um, there's theism, and and this I forgot what it's called. It's psychism. Yes, psychism. Psychism. Uh, it was, it was deism and psychism yeah. is the two sides of theism. Because it's a case to be made that you know we we have our our ideas are our, our feelings about things are spontaneous, and then we seek reasons. You know, isn't it possible? That people is there such a thing? Do you think as religious experience, religious feelings? Oh, there, there are. Is, there uh, are religious then, feelings. There are religious experiences. You can study yeah. them. They're very interesting. Um, they shouldn't play any epistemological part in our justification of what we think. Quite straight. Quite quite mm -hmm. straightforward. You know, the, look. Beyond logic. Well, but this is the thing. Yeah. I mean. I mean, the way in which experience impinges upon the way we reason has a very, very mm. well-definable um, mm. epistemological and logical structure, right? Mm. We can study it in depth. This is one of the, the, the topics I had lined out for questions, mm. uh, is that 
the idea of revelation, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a different kind of, of experience which can enter into justification. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of an experience which is beyond justification, mm -hmm. right? Which is... I mean, ultimately, the problem with religious experience is not communicable, is it? It's, it's yeah. personal, and so you have to take it on trust that a person has and, it. And I'm, and I'm not arguing that, you know, we don't have hunches. We do have... We all have hunches. Yeah. We all... We all and, and in fact, I'm not even arguing that we're, but we are very good reasoners. Most of us are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Me included, you know. Uh, but the, 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 mm -hmm. the point is that reason is a normative matter. It's about how you should act and how you should think rather than about how you do. Do, do you think that people... Do you take the view, I'm not saying you, that you take this view, but you know, this is, if you like, the computational view that somebody might take, that you know, whilst we think that we feel things and we reason, ultimately we do reason, so that there's a reasoning process going on underneath, and that you know, it's not spontaneous, it's, it's, it is ultimately everything is reasoned. Oh, no, I, I, I don't think everything is reasoned no. by any means. No, I mean, I, again, for me, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a normative matter rather than a causal right. one. We can be we can be terrible, terrible reasoners. It doesn't yes. change the fact that we shouldn't. <laughs> basically, yes. Have you ever believed in God? Yes, yes, I used to. And I, ha I actually had a non-religious experience. Yes. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's it's wonderful. I, I was walking home from a friend of mine's house in my first year of university. I just started mm -hmm. studying philosophy, so mm -hmm. I was questioning everything. Yeah. And I, I'd been having this kind of build-up towards it, where I was wondering, I'd just been starting to think about metaphysics and the nature of the universe, and whether the idea of God made any sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I walked out in the middle of, mm -hmm. of this place in Warwick, and Warwick campus mm -hmm. is quite far out, so you get a good view of the stars. Mm -hmm. And I looked up, I saw the stars, and for the first time in my life, I just kind of went, there's nothing up there. Yes. And that's perfectly fine, there's nothing wrong with that. It's funny because that seems quite a religious thing. That really oh, yeah. happened. Things things cause us mm. to change our minds. Mm. The important thing is how we assess our change mm -hmm. of minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was something that went through you. It's a, it was a moment of revelation, if you will. Yeah. yeah. But but again, someone could come along and inject me with something that yeah. makes me have a religious experience where I go, ah, oh, God exists. And what would yeah. still be most important is that you came along and challenged why I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you you mentioned uh, Plato and Socrates. Yeah. Now, one of the things that strikes me when I read the uh, the dialogues, the various dialogues, uh, that most of them, or a great many of them, end with a narrative narrative to do with the, the next world, and extensive narratives, of, often with quite detailed. Um, descriptions of what yeah, will happen yeah. to the soul and how it will, what will, how it will be transformed. Um, and I always think of of Socrates as a as a um, as a believer. You know, he is a religious man, a pious. Man. Socrates was, and, and 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 I mean, I mean, there's a sense in which Plato is a believer too, but Plato wasn't a believer in the Athenian god. Socrates almost yes. certainly was, yes. which is why his. His his <coughs> indictment on the the issue of introducing new gods is so kind of frustrating for Plato. Yeah. But um, but yeah, there's a sense in which both of them are theists. Um, I just think yeah. that that um, Plato and it's it's Plato putting words in Socrates' mouth in the Euthyphro. Plato provides us with an argument that undermines undermines all forms of theism. And uh, and. Interestingly, yeah. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, yeah. Plato. There's a certain sense in which Plato is, in my opinion, the most laudable theist. Because Plato, Plato goes so far in one direction, in such a wonderful way, and then he just makes this kind of horrible mistake at the end, which is played out in the whole history of Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Plato essentially holds my position, which is that the good is. The good, the good is independent. The good is, mm. is is the highest value, and it's it's got nothing to do with anything else. It's not because of anything else. The good is just good. Mm -hmm. um, and this is his whole theory of forms. The problem is, is that what he does with his theory of forms is then to turn it into a metaphysics. Mm. He goes, the good is the good is beyond everything, yes. and then it's the ground of everything, so yes. that everything else within the universe comes out of the ideas, which comes out of the good, yeah. and 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 it's that move that I reject. Yeah. So I, 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 I applaud Plato's rationalism. Plato, yeah. is, Plato would agree with me that 
that reason can't be stopped at any point. Yes. The problem is, is he then goes, because of this, that means reason must actually be the causal ground of everything that exists. And that's that's where it, it goes wrong. Yes. So I'm, if, if you want, I'm a heretical Platonist. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Because, you know, I, I've been, I mean, I don't know if I'm getting away from it. Today. I've been reading Hobbes recently, and he makes a very, very interesting description of the idea that if you understand, you know, it's cause and effect uh, that lead people to God. Uh, and one of the things he describes it as a blind man next to fire, and that he knows, you know, he, he, he can't describe the fire, but he feels the heat, and he he can infer that God is there. And this was a widespread idea. You know, the, the idea yeah, yeah. In, in Enlightenment was that reason demonstrated the presence of God. Um, it's just false. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, like, it's it's either either, either you have you yeah. have one of two views there. You have either yeah. we can come up with a proof of God, right, an actual demonstration. So yeah. you know. Go back to to Augustine and people like this, yeah. and go to the the ontological proof of God, which is just manifestly false. Yeah. No matter what Alvin Plantinga says, um, or you have the other position, which Alvin Plantinga also endorses, that we have some kind of faculty within ourselves that enables us to experience the divine, and it's yeah. simply that in some people this faculty doesn't work properly. So I I have a dodgy faculty of divine revelation, um, and uh, uh, again my response to that is, look. You know, you have to. I have a dodgy, dodgy faculty of divine revelation. You have to prove to me. Yeah, yeah many people do. Uh, you have to prove to us why we should have this faculty and why this faculty, when it's working right in you, gives us knowledge. You have to be able to provide the same kind of argument that scientists provide when they say, you know. The, the, the Hadron Super Collider in CERN gives us good information about the Higgs boson or whatever it is you want to talk about. You have to be able to explain why. And it's in principle impossible in the case of, of divine, rev divine revelation. And that's I just, again, it, mm -hmm. the epistemology of revelation is, is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you mentioned the good, that the, the, the good um, trumps all other values. Now, that, is, that's is almost that, the definition of the good. Yes. Now, isn't that quite tautological? Because you could say, is, is the good the good because it trumps all other values? Or does it trump all other values because it's the good? <laughs> oh, what a good <laughs> question. Uh, what a great <laughs> question. Um, um, I, again, I think that they're almost equi equivalent. Mm. I mean, again, this is the thing is that, that like, I think... I think you can't separate what goodness is mm. from that characteristic. I think if there's one thing that mm. defines what we mean by goodness, that makes this word into something more than just a term we use, yes. and makes it into this concept that we can potentially introduce to people, mm -hmm. if there's one thing you hold on to about the good, it's that it trumps everything. Okay. So, if the good... Is it of God? Then it isn't the good God. Well, this is this is this is what Plato ends up kind of coming into. That 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 ah well, let's say that that the good just is God. It it, it is the metaphysical ground of whatnot. Um, and I think that um, I have some independent arguments as to why we should maintain a radical separation between. Um, the normative domain, which practical reasoning deals with, mm. and the theoretical domain, which metaphysics deals with. I have some independent arguments, and they're related to Hume's whole coining of the naturalistic fallacy. You can't get an is from an ought. Mm. Um, um, mm. So you can't get an ought from an is, but it works either way as well. Um, but mm, another way of looking at it is essentially what Plato does is open the door to more radical forms of theism. Plato was like the, the limit point of theism. And what he does is open the door for Aristotle to come along and say, well, actually, ah, we'll, we'll say that, that the good is the unmoved mover. We'll provide a metaphysical description of what it is. Because as soon as you start saying it's the cause, it's the ground, you open up 
questions about its nature. And as soon as you open up questions about its nature, the properties that you ascribe to its nature start being able to be deployed as reasons within practical debate. And so, essentially, as soon as Plato puts his foot in that door, mm -hmm. um, it's open for everybody else to, to open it up and let all the bad arguments through. Yeah. You, can't, you can't just have, well, the good is God. As soon as you allow the in principle possibility of that kind of reasoning, the card is out and it's on the table. And we need to stop the card from being on the table. We need to rip up the card. There's a necessity. Yeah. There's more. There is more debate to be right. had there. Though. Um. So just going back to this religion and theism, it's it's unre It's is it something that people um, think, or is it something they feel? Not religion. It, yeah. Um. Both. You know, both. I mean. Both. I mean. I mean, not always exclusively one or the other. I mean, most people think it because either they've been brought up to think it or because they've had some kind of experience which they think has revealed to them it's true. Um, um, the relation between thought and feeling is a, is a complex one. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, for example, uh, Hume says, uh, you know, famously, that the reason it uh, is this should be or is the slave of the... Um, of the passion the pithy, a false comparison. The pithy response is that it is, but it shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> is the, the pithy response is, yeah. yeah, of course, again, often we're bad reasoners. And yeah. in fact, often, you see, often feeling mm -hmm. and intuition play a necessary part mm -hmm. within reasoning. They're very useful. Mm -hmm. the, the point is that at the end of the day, reason trumps. You know, like if, and I use this as, as an example because I don't know if anybody's ever experienced <laughs> sort of bad depression mm. but in when you're in a bad depression your feelings lie to you your feelings give you an impression of the world that is objectively false often at least right and the important thing when that happens is to go you know what i feel that this is the case but i know it's not right i can reason about the way the world is in a way which is to some extent independent of my feelings and i should go with that mm. right so would you say in that sense you have to have faith in reason? No. No. Um, no. You should be you should have commitment, conviction. Yeah. Right? But faith, faith I, I agree with Kierkegaard. What mm. faith is, what makes faith unique and distinct from conviction, yeah. is that it goes beyond the rational. And in that sense, you shouldn't have faith. No one should have faith. Um, we should have conviction, mm -hmm. right? But, but not faith. Okay. Um, just one. Um, uh, just one more question. Then um, you, you spoke about the structure later on, the structure of things. I think. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the re of reason, the structure of, yeah. the, of the world, um, and the good. Yes. Uh, are, is is this? Are we? Are we talking about the realm of the a priori? Are we talking about that reason is prior? Yes, yes. When, when, when. I mean, I. This is another commitment I hold. I, I, I mentioned at the end that I'm, I'm very indebted to Kant, and mm -hmm. I, I agree with Kant that there is such a thing as what he would call the transcendental. Mm -hmm. There's the conditions for the possibility of knowledge, right? And you think that he was a, re a re religious man? He was a religious man, but, uh, but he's he was a. Also a monk, wasn't he? No, no, well, I mean, he, he, he never got married and he was very yeah. committed to duty and whatnot, but he, yeah. he wasn't a monk. I mean, he, but, but Kant, again, like Plato, gives you all the resources you need to just get rid of. I mean, he has several sort of arguments as to why, although we know we can't know whether God exists, mm -hmm. we have to sort of think that he does. Yes. Um, and it's entirely yes. possible to remove these bits from Kant, and you should. Yes. In fact, I'd argue, and I will be arguing in a paper with a, with a friend of mine, that there's a, a philosopher in the 20th century mm -hmm. called Wilfred Sellers, he's mm -hmm. an American philosopher, mm -hmm. fantastic. And essentially he completes Kant. He, he yeah. takes Kant and he, he, he takes out this kind of last problematic bit which connects theoretical and practical reasoning in some kind of conception of God. He removes that. 
and gives us the resources to be properly rational. So that's a right. response there. But yeah, I, get, I'm I, behind the a priori. Can I do a Columbia here and ask just one more question? Go for um, it, go for it. Uh, this is where it all turns around. Is it, <laughs> is God, do you, you know, because obviously uh, Spinoza's famous for saying that God isn't like a kid. It's not, he's not like a, it's a mistake to think of him like a person. It's a mistake to think he's concerned with us. And for that reason, many called him a Hobbes, in fact, called him a, an atheist. Yeah. So do you think, do you think of the God that you reject as a thing or, or an agent, a well, mind? What I, what, this is why I split theism in two, in a deism and psychism. And as I say, Spinoza, basically he's a deist. I mean, he's, he's actually, you call him a pan-deist, maybe. He, he believes everything is God, and God is the imminent cause of all yeah. things that we understand. Um, he does derive certain normative ideas from them, but they're very non-psychist. They're not intentionalist. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have independent disagreements with those, but yeah. um, again, I... I think there are independent arguments against Spinoza's It just seems position. they're so close, don't they? It's so difficult to establish. Well, it, it's possible yeah. to, and, and it's possible to make independent arguments against David. Yeah. Um, and I think, as I say, I think Heidegger gives us the resources to do that. If you want a, a brief summary of the argument, Heidegger's basic argument is mm -hmm. we can't understand the nature of entities in terms of an entity without circularity. So... Right. Like, for instance, the classic thing is in scholasticism to say that, well, beings are what is created. They are ends createm. And then God is ends in createm. He's the thing that isn't created. He's the thing that creates. Right? But you can't define the ends in terms of ends createm because God himself is an ends. Right? You can't, so you can't actually get to the meaning of the ends bit. You can't get to the meaning of things. You can't get to, to use an awkward Heideggerian phrase, the thingness of things, if you try and understand it in terms of things themselves. And, and, and if you follow this reasoning out, it, it rules out any kind of what Heidegger would call on or theology. It rules out any attempt to understand the, the fundamental nature of reality in terms of a supreme being, even if you conceive of it in non-mentalistic terms. Okay. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Pete, for subjecting himself to that, to that Andean scrutiny. Well, it was, it was an unmedicated pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you for both. We break for 10 minutes and resume for discussion. Okay, so you stated that Abraham was irrational when he subordinated his sense of the good to God. Yes. Okay, now, and that if we apply practical reasoning, um, we, we can actually understand the good as being of paramount, yes. but we mustn't infuse it with this and, and put it in this metaphysical realm because yes. then, okay, I've got that. Now, if I was to swap the word good for courage, because Abraham's courage in his act of sacrificing his son was phenomenal. True. Okay, so can we not apply the same principles to, to another term like courage? No, because I think, as I say, I, what I, the minimal definition of the good I've provided is a very formal one, just... What is good is what you should do in all circles, you know, above all other things, right? Um, and, and can you prove that to me? I, I, think, I think that's a definition of the good. Uh, there's, there's more to it, but that's the basic definition mm -hmm. of, like, when it comes down to brass tacks, right, if we have to argue about a particular <coughs> practical decision, at the end of the day, above everything else, we argue in the name of what is good, right? Um, now... Part of that may involve arguments about virtue, right? Be it a virtue of courage or wisdom or whatever. 
But the thing with virtue is that although it's a very interesting way of organizing the way in which we think about, you know, value and ethical rules and, and whatnot, I think it's, it's a genuinely very good one and not used enough today. Yeah. Um, again, it's, it's all conditional. It's all mm. sort of, I mean, I, I, Aristotle, you know, very famously <coughs> talked about the golden mean, sort of saying, you know, there's a certain point at which courage just becomes, you know, carelessness. Um, yeah. and, and so there's a per certain point in which the things we would normally identify with courage become wrong. They become bad in the, the sense of being opposite or counter to the good. Um, and so, again, I, I think that, that, that talk of virtue can be very helpful in an ethical context, but it's always framed within the debate about the good. Okay. No virtue ever takes over the good. Yes, um, so, uh, can you explain what made you think uh, this old man who hears voices in his head to tell him to kill his son, and who thinks that this is a good thing to do? Why do you think that that's good? No, I'm not, I'm not looking at whether it's is good or not, I'm looking at the courage of his act. Now what fed that courage is is not the, is not what I'm debating. It's the fact that he was going to sacrifice his son. And that to me would be would have to be the ultimate courage when it's so utterly life denying. And if it, for anything else we're on earth it's to actually But your assumption is that he was going to sacrifice and he's hearing these voices and the voices change their tune. Well, why do you think that it's courageous? Because he, if Abraham had not heard the voices to change his tune, he would have sacrificed his son. And that's, that's an act of absolute courage. We can, all, we can always change the thought experiment. We can always turn it into a thought experiment of not sacrificing one son for God, but you know, choosing between the death of one son and the life of a million people or, or whatever. And then we might want to re-describe it and say, yes, this is a genuinely courageous act or Morning. Thank you. Mike, please. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm wondering, isn't the good always culturally created, culturally determined? Um, what, is, what we see as good today in our culture isn't good in other cultures of the world. For example, we hold democracy to be good. A lot of other cultures don't hold democracy to be good. A lot of cultures back over the years don't. So. So what are we saying the good is then? It's just the best that we come up with rationally at the time. Well, I mean, look, it, it, it's the difference between good and what we think is good. Just like there's a difference between what is true and what we think is true. I mean, I, I, I deliberately try not to talk about good in terms of context, in terms of this is good or that is good, but simply to talk about it in terms of form. Right? And I think that all of these cultures are in some sense aiming at the good. They're trying to come up with a conception of what the content of the good involves. Right? Um, I think in virtue of the form of the good, we can actually let them have an argument. We can actually say, instead of just going, oh well, you have your conception of the good, I have my conception of the good. I think we can get move beyond that kind of phase and go in. Well, let's actually talk and let's work out uh, you know, what, why do we think this is good and you don't, and which one of us is right. I think, you know, I, I think there is... But at a, at a practical level, that's clearly not happening in the world. And yeah, it's but, uh, rarely happened in the world. I, I'm a philosopher, I deal with a few <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll give you the principle, someone else can worry about the practice. Um, <laughs> Um, Mike, uh, you're entitled to your opinion. The idea is not necessarily no. to argue with me. Yes. Okay, David, please. Um, well, I follow your argument uh, from rationale to, to <coughs> the conception of the good, which is like <coughs> God or <coughs> Mr. <Mr>. Owen. <coughs> um, but it seems to me that the <coughs> Uh, you're, you're escaping from faith. However, in practice, the good, 
as you perceive it, is conditional, highly conditional, on what you know about the truth of your environment. Uh, and you're getting messages, lies, truths, everything all around you, which are forming your combination, or your conception of the good. And from those uh, inputs, you <coughs> you have to believe one set or the other. So you're back to uh, defining the good on the basis of faith. No, what because, you believe. because belief isn't there. I mean, this is the thing. I, I, I use the word conviction, right, to, uh, to, to indicate intensity of belief, right? But I think conviction falls short of faith because what faith does is to, to cut off the possibility of challenge. Whereas I think that no matter, you know, in the ideal, no matter how convinced I am of a particular belief, I should always, in some sense, be open to its challenge. And that's what it is to be interested in the truth of the belief, to be willing to have that belief challenge, because there is a difference between your belief and the truth. Um, now, you know, I, I, I don't think this poses any problem for my conception of goodness. All it, all it shows is that Yes, we are always in this kind of, we all, we're always faced with this kind of horrible existential challenge of, right, I'm responsible for what I think. Um, how do I make sure what I think is as good as it can possibly be? And we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I accept that I probably have a whole bunch of false beliefs. The difficulty is I don't know which ones they are. <laughs> if I knew which ones they are, I wouldn't have them anymore. So the the issue is is to or the challenge rather the responsibility is to go through the process to go through the process of accepting challenges mm -hmm. making challenges mm -hmm. justifying you know basically the process of giving and asking for reasons. Well, it seems to me you're you're back with Plato because you have a concept of a good which is an idea which is. Uh, you can never reach. Uh, but we can we can be faced with tasks we can never so achieve. Words, what the, the practical version of the good is so contingent that um, if it almost requires. No, I mean, this is what I, a sort of you don't have to answer people. Bearing, let them be confused. Sorry, yeah. Uh, oh no, I like I like to get. You are not responsible for this. <laughs> I am. I am responsible. I, I, um, that's the whole point. I'm, I have responsibility. Um, this well, is what truth is about. You see, a tr truth, truth is about responsibility. You go through the process. Of His behavior is the best answer, not what he said. Well, but, but what I am saying is, I don't think the sheer fact that we are all faced with that we're probably wrong about a lot of things. Um, really licenses any kind of positive belief in anything else. I really don't. I, I think it, it's like it, it's very much like the, the what gets called the, the pessimistic meta induction in science. Right? Some people will go, well, all of our scientific theories have so far proven to be, you know, false and been superseded over the history. Of, therefore, they always will be, and we'll never get anywhere. And I just think that's a bad argument. It's a really, it's a really bad argument which misunderstands the process of rational progress that has occurred in history. And the, the same thing is true in the area of the good. I mean, yeah, of course, you know, people used to keep slaves. You know, Plato had a whole bunch of terrible beliefs despite making these wonderful arguments. But we can say that he's wrong because we have good reasons for saying so. But why can't we just be skeptical? Is there anything wrong with instead of being, this isn't the point, I want to make this what you're saying is that you didn't bring in the, the skepticism that people, you don't have to be religious you don't are atheistic you don't have to be you want, we all are rational by that being part of the way we are to be honest uh, but you can stop the skeptical attitude 
I mean, you've already said yourself, you, you put the good and what, the good has been what we need for, so we don't really know what that is. So, why not be sceptical? Why not have a more sceptical point, um, really? Well, it's just about, I mean, scepticism can be a virtue. Yeah. yeah. In, exactly. it, it can be a virtue. Um, but but it, it's, again, like anything else, it's finding the balance. It's finding the balance between conviction and uh, conviction and healthy scepticism. You know, Basically, of having healthy skepticism rather than unhealthy skepticism. Yeah. And there are unhealthy skepticism. There are really unhealthy skepticism. There might be. Um, okay, let's point, exactly. bring the point after proof, but I think Mike Jenkins has been waiting patiently. Is that okay? Yeah, I wanted to, to uh, refer back to the, this, this Abraham argument. You can see, obviously, Kierkegaard has famously made this in the middle of the 19th century. But more recently, most scholars think that a Abraham's didn't exist. Um, and that the whole point of the Abraham myth is later writers, later writers, uh, Jewish intellectuals, trying to get the message across. We used to think God wanted us to sacrifice the firstborn when the circumstances demanded. We have now moved on. And we no longer wonder, or rather, God, we now understand God as no longer requiring that of us. Uh, now, obviously, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, a Lutheran like, like here, the girl wasn't, wasn't going to think of it that way. But I suggest what that story tells us, rather than telling Kierkegaard, is that we now know that those stories are just part of the process of us trying to define what is good. And that um, it all starts off with us. We I, just keep making it up. I, yeah. I've, I've got no problem with that. I yeah. mean, as I yeah. say, for me, what's interesting is, is the argument that Kierkegaard draws out and dramatizes with this. So yeah. I have, I have, I've got, I mean, I have no, almost no exegetical commitments with regard to the Bible. And in fact, to, to take the wider point, I mean, I, I've got no problem with, with, taking up biblical resources or any kind of religious resources who try to understand um, heretical commitments. Yeah. I, I really don't. I, 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 think, I think they can be really positive. But I think they can be really positive in pretty much the same sense in which all kinds of different narratives that we've developed within our tradition can be positive. We can, we can, we can look at all kinds of different literature as giving us giving us really interesting insights and posing important problems, um, and those can be drawn on with an ethical debate. It's just I don't think that any of them should have um, um, sort of intrinsic authority. Well, I think that's the point I'm making because Plato does it this way. Um, the, the Jewish guys doing it this way, various other writers and other civilizations do it. It's all us trying to work it out. Yeah, okay. But the important thing is, is that we, the process of working out is done right. And that, for me, means, and I hate using that phrase, for me, but uh, I think that means actually moving past the theistic framing of these issues into a position where we're dealing with the ethical directly. So for me, I, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, Socrates and Kant and figures like, you know, John Stuart Mill or whatever, I think these people are making explicit forays in the ethical debate, whereas previously the stories we were telling ourselves were really implicit forays in the ethical debate. And although we can draw on those implicit resources, we should be very, very careful not to value them above the explicit ones. Because people who are actually concerned directly with talking about the good are doing, are doing the right thing, rather than trying to approach it indirectly. Okay, um, uh, Jack first. <laughs> yeah, um, I found that uh, talk really you know, stimulating. But at the end, I found it convincing. I, I felt that, that ultimately, I wasn't able to progress further than, than I started with. Uh, I, 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 I think, in a sense, it was a bit, for me, it was a bit tautologist, uh, saying, I think it's on the point of, you're saying that the reason is good, and good is reason. And, and 
uh, it didn't seem to lead me anywhere finally at the end. But uh, I, I, I put it, and maybe you were already where you should be. I mean, I put it in, uh, perhaps more specifically, uh, you know, the, the you, you're addressing really fundamental questions in philosophy about about can we have ethics as a question. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. And you know, was it Dostoevsky said, if God is dead, then we can do anything. Uh, I think it's not so in in a sense, um, <coughs> well, and I think. Uh, I think Nietzsche also said, didn't he, that uh, if God is dead, then all, that man is also dead, or worse that effect, that uh, because we we obtain our view of what man is from from uh, from a, a, a religious or, or some sort of uh, absolute. Anyway, the, 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 we must have said specifically. I think one of the reasons why I wasn't uh, convinced in the end is I'm not sure that you can support the way things are putting on the idea of reason. I think uh, uh, there's more than more than one view of reason. As you know, there's a there's a um, sort of practical as you were pointing out. There's the um, the pure logic, the logic form of reason. And uh, you know, Wittgenstein attempted to apply wasn't you know, yeah Wittgenstein applied reason in his tractatus. In the end, he came to the conclusion that reason didn't take him anywhere. He said in the final chapters, if you've understood this, you realise that it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 for me, you're, you're, paying, you're paying too much weight on the on the idea of reason. There's all other elements. You, you've heard the phrase, the heart has its reasons, but it's not the reasons that you're talking about. It's not the reasons of logic. Well, but, but again, I mean, like, look, I, I hate to be taught logical again here, but if, if they're not the reasons of logic, they're not reasons. If logic gives us the form of reasoning, if you work outside of it, you're not reasoning. It's that simple, really. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Roy, then Pru, then Conrad, then Eva. And then Ab is waiting in the wings. Roy. Uh, Peter, no, I don't want to take you it outside your remit, which, which I, I, mean, I really love. Uh, but there is a sense in which I want to contextualize this in some sense. You've gone towards ethics and the good because you're talking about, you're juxtaposing that or comparing it with uh, the divine. Yeah, um, and the divine is metaphysical. But if we go from uh, epistemology, which I'm taking, that's the area in which you're, you're, you're placing ethics. Am, am I misusing? It's 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 not the. I mean, if ethics is independent of epistemology, but there are. But it's the handling of epistemological. Yeah, there, there, there are epistemological yeah, issues yeah, in ethics. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. So that's, that's what I meant to choose. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my my thought was you. you Quote good as and in Plato, of course, good is the top. Yeah. But in other Greek writing, it's beauty. And this is wonderful. And um, for me, you see, I think that takes one, and I'll just stay with epistemology, ontology for the minute, towards another realm, which isn't metaphysical. Well, you can play with that, but it isn't. I wouldn't say it's metaphysical. Uh, it, it's uh, it's amongst us here, if I can sort of sort of ground it. Anyway, I just throw that. Over. No, I mean that. That's wonderful. I mean, I, I, I had actually mentioned this to someone that I, I actually, I, you know, as Jack's correctly pointed out, and other people have pointed out, you know, I, I take my paper, my paper sort of ends on a negative note, and I don't really tell you where I'm going positively with ethics, and and actually beauty is the direction in which I'm, I'm heading to some extent, because I, I mean, I, I think the relationship between the beautiful and the good is incredibly interesting, and, and if I can sketch it out very briefly. What I'd say is this, if I, if I defined the good as sort of the highest value within the practical domain, um, if I was provided a very minimal definition of beauty, the definition would be, it is that which is unconditionally valuable. Like, that is not valuable for any particular reason, it's just unconditional. It's not useful, it's, not, it's just unconditionally valuable. Now, I think, uh, this is a, a, a kind of warped, Platonic ideas I've been playing with. I think that it might be the case, in fact, I do think it's the case, that the very existence of beauty in the world is, in fact, what is most valuable. The existence of unconditionally valuable things it is, is what is most valuable. The question then is um, what does that require of us? And I think that actually um, there are conditions imposed upon us which constitute the condition of the possibility of there being beauty. And the name of those conditions is the good. The good 
is the condition of the possibility of there being unconditional value in the network. And so, and there's a, there's a whole additional story we could tell about this. And what this means is that in a certain sense, that the good is subordinate to the beautiful, but in another sense, the good is higher because the good provides the conditions under which there can be this. So we always have to follow ethical dictates over aesthetic dictates. So will you be defining good? Huh? Will you be defining good? Ah, uh, hopefully. <laughs> could, could I throw in one quickly? You, you, you took it so that the good could rise. But, but if we take it out of that realm and say that the only way to stand in front of beauty is with awe, then you shift it again, don't you? Well, it, this is very interesting. Is that I, I think I think awe. There's very there is place for talking about awe, um, uh, and and things like this. This is what I was kind of responding to uh, Horace about in in Mike's talk last time. Was that I I think there is space for talking about awe and art. I mean, art, art is a species of beauty, but it's very very interesting. And I think that that. Art should take over the role that a lot of people reserve for the mystical and mysticism. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I think against Wittgenstein, yeah. that we can, we can defend this place for art, which is entirely um, commensurable with rationality, mm -hmm. which is not seen as something super rational. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely, it needs working out, it's a lot of work. Can I just, I the, the guard this morning at the article, which was already the case for the art gallery should become the churches for the secular. So in a sense, it's addressing the issue at all. As I think they have been for at least 70 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. True, you waited with your real point. Ah, uh, my real point, yes. <laughs> my real point, mention Alvin Plantinga. <laughs> what? Alvin Plantinga. I yeah. don't want to talk to me. So. <laughs> I haven't read a lot of Alvin Plantinga. So. Nor have I, to be honest. Let's see. I know that uh, Calvin had this idea that there was a, and this is a general discussion, not just to you, Fine. about um, that people, some people had a sense of divinity. Right, and this is like a sixth sense, you know, like we have all the other things, a special sense in people, some people, which enables us to kind of sense God. Now, I was thinking, oh, that sounds a bit weird. And then I thought of people who had synesthesia, which if you're familiar with it, is people who can see like maybe music and shows like color and have a sort of mixed up sense of perception and you can see things slightly differently from the rest of the time, like you know. And for a long time this was thought to be know, know, know. you know, what is this? They're just a bit mad, a bit weird. But it has been more and more measured as a good or people being a condition of synesthesia. So it is possible that this sense of divinity could actually be some kind of brain thing people don't quite know about, or mind psychic thing, or maybe don't know about. But I, but I was thinking about this, and then the next thing I thought about, and I, I didn't get time to research it very much, was there's a group of philosophers who think, and I think Hume was one of them, who thought we had a moral sense. That in a sort of materialistic way, we also had a sense of moralis, right? We could think of ethics, politics kind of a sense we had in our brain. And so I was thinking, well, maybe the sense is divinity, the sense is morality, are connected, if they exist, if we can. Because both the divine and the why we have morals and where they come from are questions still in issue. We can't quite decide what they are. So my theory is, is it possible we have this kind of sense possibly connect to both or one of and, and I was thinking, well, that sounds a bit easy. But how do we know? How do we know? Because we recently discovered a, another taste. We need to discover two other tastes. Uh, one's you now, and the most recent one, I can't remember what it is. There's another taste. Uh, it's a fat, I think. It's fat, 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 that's the one. So I thought, hey, we didn't know that before, but now we're, we're discovering things all the time. So it is just possible that some people have a... Uh, a sense of the divine, and if you take it further or wider, a sense of the moral, or a sense of the beauty, and they're all 
or some of what I call a numinous sense more generally, we could have this actually. But, but if you're interested in human, Kant, Kant talks about the senses communis as being very the important. Senses communis, that's uh, being important, important for his account of the beautiful. Uh, but I, I have things I'd like to say, I think. Yeah, but let just everybody just else kind of dive in. Yeah, let everyone else dive. Sorry. But what I was going to say, how do you. How would you just prove the census diminished? That was Calvin's idea. Um, surprisingly easy. The thing that Hamilton <laughs> said was that those who couldn't sin, now this is where I completely dissent from Plantinga, if he did say this, those who can't sense the divine are sinners. Oh, that's me that, done. That's that me is horrible, right? Um, but I mean, let's assume, let's strike that bit out and then just assume it may be an actual sense that some of us are lucky or unlucky enough. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's very, very easy to disprove that. Oh, yeah, that was just a joke. Hey, that was a joke. No, 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 I don't mean that one. I mean, I think it's very easy to, to argue against the census of the minutes because the, the, the point is that the divine is not of the same kind as fat or non or, or, or anything like this. It's, it's you know, you, you, you're... No, but that, I was only the same says as an analogous thing in terms of Previously, we did not. We we thought there were the taste, the foretaste, and that was it. Now yeah, we discover, as we go along through time, through scientific investigation, or whatever, there are other tastes. Yeah, but right? the it's same. It's the, the, the brain is largely yeah. under map territory. The point. The point is that there's intrinsic, like the claim that we might discover that we've been able to sense the divine all along. Yeah. Right. Is of a different kind to the claim that we might discover. That we've been able to, to taste fat all Well, uh, yes, I agree. I put it, but it's it's of a different kind because yeah. the kind of object that is claiming that we might have a sense of is different. The fat, right, or or, or whatever, is a is a naturalistic ca category that we, we already understand. We already have a context for understanding how the interaction might happen. Right, we can go, okay, well, okay, this is how taste buds work. We can see how some taste buds might potentially be able to, to, to relate to this. We can we can speculate about causal stories. We can't speculate about a causal story in relation to the Can you tell me the causal story of the brain and the mind then? I can't. No, 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 we can't. That's what, no, I'm no, not saying no, it's the same category. What I'm saying is there's still things that are unknown. Yeah, of course there are things that are unknown. But what I'm saying is it's it's of a different kind. Like like look, we can I can't tell you. The, the, a complete causal story of, of, of the brain, the mind, and even the complete sensory system, right? We're still discovering things, but we're discovering them by inquiring into causal relationships. What I'm saying is, we, we intrinsically have no clue what a causal relationship to the divine would be. Not it's not something we can study. It's no. not... No. Why, why equate that experience to the divine? I'm using it to do I'm saying there are things that are unknown. I mean, take the sure, sure. sense of the synesthesia. Sure. If I told you I have sense of the 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 we well, can't have a the, the problematic it word. Have to be a, an idea of the divine. The know. problematic word, not just for this, is of. Excuse me, right? Is of. Because as soon as you use that little word of, right, you implicitly refer to what it's a sense of. And so you've got to be committed to the existence mm. of the thing that it's a sense yeah. of in order to posit it. Right? So it might be that there are these interesting, and in fact, I think it's been, been studied. That there are genuine religious experiences. Religious experiences exist. The question is, how do we describe them, right? And to describe them as experiences of the divine is to presuppose this this additional metaphysical category. Now, can I say that you're speaking your speech presupposes a lot? Using any language presupposing a language. That is a bind you can't get out of. Whatever yeah, but that, you that's, use, if you that's, use language, that, you're in it. That's a nuclear argument. Oh. That, that, that argument, right, goes, well, we you're can't saying. say anything about anything. May I, suggest, may I suggest you don't address your comments to Pete? No, Sorry. That, that, yeah. no, they weren't intended to be addressed. <laughs> Sorry. Given, given that you, young man, what's your name? Uh, Jack. 
John, given that you jumped the queue, which is okay. Sorry, it's all, no, I'm sorry there is I'm sorry there is such a queue, but go ahead and make your point. I almost like making Oh, no, um, no, I, I didn't really have a point, I was just kind of getting involved in that. But, I'm, I'm sorry to dominate. But one of you raised a hand before. Oh, okay, sorry, it's kind of diverting away from what we're talking about. So ignore Pro and... Uh, okay, sorry. Um, it's kind of going back to the, the idea of an ethical framework just purely through reason. Yeah. You equate yeah. reason with logic. And Why? Well, again, I wouldn't want to equate them, okay. but, but logic is definitely important. I, I, I object in the strongest possible terms to the idea that there is reason, <coughs> sort no. of, which is illogical. I yes. really reject that. <laughs> yeah. Why do you have such deference to Pete? Why can't you make a point? <laughs> well, yes, That's not um, directly you personally, by the way. No, <laughs> no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Carry, carry on. Carry yes. on. Um, my question, I agree with you that I think on a basic grounds, um, to, to create ethics or like a, an ethical blueprint on basic grounds is often destructive. Um, but I'm not sure how we create um, an ethical blueprint just purely by logic. And this is quite a subtractive goal, but I think if you purely use logic, then there is no good or no. It's almost cliche, but there is no good or evil if you purely yeah. use logic. Will reason. you not? Will you not answer mm. that? So what yeah. other people can do yes. that. All right. Yes. So anyone else want to address? Yes, uh, Conrad. Oh, course, yeah. Conrad, been waiting for a long time. Yes, very good. Because, uh, discussion gets hotter. Yes. Uh, actually, my impression about the about the lecture was very interesting. Uh, However, I got the impression that you use a kind of logical scaffolding instead of a dis descriptive uh, approach to reality. I would say uh, there shouldn't be probably a discussion about the role of brain uh, if, you, if you talk about that before. Uh, I mean, uh, Instead of uh, instead of seeing reality, instead of seeing brains, our biology, uh, our interactions, our culture, uh, you use logical terms. And it's, uh, generally, it's a kind of uh, symbolic description, like uh, like for the machines, like for computers. I understand that approach because uh, it's a kind of, I take, I take it as a kind of proposition to us to, uh, to use this kind of system uh, or not, of course, uh, in our lives. Yeah? Uh, that means uh, just take it, understand this, this, uh, this way of reality or not. Uh, and I, what I cannot understand uh, in this, uh, if I if I accept your point of view, which is uh, for me quite as a fact, as I say, I prefer building than this couple. Uh, sorry for uh, 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 but if I take this point of view, uh, I. Uh, how can you explain? Because you, you, you talk us about uh, division between uh, good and God. Yeah? And if you did that the division, uh, generally, God shouldn't be a problem. So it can still exist. It can be equal one, equal one, stupid, wrong, dead. No. Yeah. Some, something scary for you or not, or something nice, or you love them. You know. yeah. uh, there are plenty of people that, that get good, uh, that's got uh, good or bad experience and understand it. But why to kill people? Or have? Or death? It's a two stage project. Uh, and I, I, I'll just say this quickly and then other people can. Come in. The two stage project, like I said, was two sides to the and the ethical and the ethical. And my talk focused upon the ethical. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, 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 my focus was upon showing that, that God needs to be kicked out of the ethical domain. 
whether you want to kick them out metaphysical or just kick them out completely is, is, is an additional argument. I think that argument can be made, it should be made, but I didn't present it. Um, so, again, it's, it's an additional question. It was, it was my well, it's impression that you, you just to go further and just you would like to... to yeah, I, I, I would like to get rid of them completely, but I, I'm not claiming to have shown it, that we should. I'm not claiming that. I, it's, my, it's my position, mm -hmm. but I, I, I will justify it at the time. I just, I just came to, to your, uh, your territory, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, just from the logical point yeah, of view. Yeah. Well, I think from the logical point of view it can be, mm -hmm. it can be shown as well. I, I think that in a very parallel way, it, it's about showing that actually in both the practical and the theoretical domains, what we need to do is get rid of the idea of ultimate reasons. So, uh, to, and again, I let other people take over, but there's something which is very important in the history of philosophy called the principle of sufficient reason. It's the, I the principle of sufficient reason. The idea is everything has a reason. Everything has a reason. Why it is. Be it in the practical or theoretical domain. We, you know, either this is because of blah blah blah, or or this should be because of blah blah blah. So the reason is explanation. Well, yeah. Now, famously, Spinoza and Leibniz were led to um, propose metaphysical conceptions of God on the basis of the principle of sufficient reason because they said, look, <laughs> if everyone has a reason, you've got to be led back to this ultimate reason which is at the basis of everything. And I think that we can have sufficient reason without that. That's a, a misinterpretation of the idea of sufficient reason uh, in both areas. So I think we can argue for a position where we say, look, reasoning is about always about specific reasons rather than ultimate reasons. And that this means you can give a reason for everything, you just never stop giving them. There's no you never come to an end where there's a final ultimate. Yeah. Um, but that again, in order to, to, to describe that more I'd have to go into a, a great a deal of detail. But if anybody else would like to pick up Eva, Jack's point about Eva, please. I think it came across for me, I mean, I must admit, I didn't really understand some of the intellectual terms and the academic side, but on a personal level, just as a, a person talking, what came across to me was, I just think one of the comments that you made was is that people who believe in God have kind of caused, sometimes closed down the argument because they put the card on the table. I think, am I right in that what you've said about yeah, that? Yeah. Well, for me, I think you did exactly the same in the sense that you were, and nothing wrong with it, I mean, it is your belief almost as if like God transcends good, good trans transcends God, but almost as for you, good is God. So that is the framework <laughs> which you're actually talking, so your card is on the table as well. Yeah, but my, that's, my, my card. I, that's the first point. Okay. And then the second point is, <laughs> is and I find, I find that difficulty because I, it, didn't, it didn't seem to me on any of the, the arguments or conversations you were having, it was almost from your body language I mean, especially when you're having a debate with crew, and I can't remember what Jack was saying about rational and reasoning. You, the, the argument about what you were going to say was almost there. There was no kind of feeling that you were thinking about actually what this individual was saying and twirling it around your head and thinking, I actually I think I know what he's saying and this, that, and the other. You had a fixed position. So your card was on the table. That, that's what came across. The second point is, is that just in relation to that is when you make the sweeping statement, and I know it was, you, you, are, you readily admitted that you, you know, some people have beliefs and don't know always what they're right, yeah. but sweepingly you said, when people have depressed moods, they don't see the world in a rational, logic way. I found that quite, you just snapped that into the conversation. Well, I, I don't, when I have depressed moods, I don't. I mean, maybe, maybe it's not the same for, for other people, but I can, I can point back to points in my life where I have demonstrably false beliefs because because I, I wasn't feeling them. But that's an over generalization to use your experiences and then that would have been fine if you'd actually explained that. But actually well, I, 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 did, I did that I did say I did say maybe this isn't the same for everyone. Fair enough. If you don't have to answer. Well, I, 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 I like what you said. I'm an open book. I'm an open book. But, uh, uh, but the more you answer. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> but, but can I just. The more trouble you will get. Can, I just, <laughs> can I just tackle your, your original point? Right? Yes, I mean, the fixed look, position point. My card is on the table in the sense that I have gone here. Here is my belief. Here are my reasons for my belief. Have at them. Attack them. Challenge them. You know, give me, give me hell, and I will give you hell back. Right? The card I'm talking about is not. Here is my belief. 
I'll add them. The, the card I'm talking about, the theist being able to clear, here is my belief, it is inviolable. You are not allowed to challenge it um, because, because of faith. Uh, and, and, and that's what I'm objecting to. What's different between me and the theist is you can, you can do whatever you want to my beliefs, right? There's no limits. Whereas the theist places a limit. Are you, are you, are you inviting us to give us reasons? Why your use of reason is wrong? Yes, totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ab, it's last. Oh. It's all right. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> 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 all right. I, I ask you, you, you make a point? You oh, sorry. I thought you said you were going to make a point. Sorry. Oh. Fire away, Mark. You argued uh, throughout the afternoon that um, uh, reason and good. Uh, <laughs> Through this, we know what we know, and that we we will choose to act to to be good. I didn't say we will. What I said, we should. We should. But you see, reason when people um, when people often do things that are bad, and and they do them knowing that they are bad. And they reason, they use reason to justify what they're doing bad. No, 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 I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing. I'm not, I'm not shaking, I'm just sort of... But you see, reason is not therefore a, a suitable and sufficient argument to say that, you know, we should... I mean, reason doesn't take anywhere, does it? If you can use it to... Justify bad as well as you can just use it to justify good. Well, no, okay, I mean, look, I mean, you can, you can misuse reason. Yeah, fine, great. There's, but there's no alternative. There's, it's not, it's not there's, no, there's no alternative to reason. There is no alternative to argument. Right. Uh, but it, the thing is, when people misuse reason, right, our duty is to point out and demonstrate their misuse on the basis of reason itself, right? Re reason is an intrinsically normative notion. It's something that you can do right or wrong. When people do it wrong, our job is to correct them. And we correct them on the basis of the idea of reason itself, right? That's the... But now we see that reason fails, in fact, to fulfill the the, uh, the, the, the task that you... No, you people you, fail. You, you people it's fail. Tool, oh. And it's an analytical tool. It doesn't do that. No, people, people fail. We fail. I fail. We all fail all the time. Right? <laughs> Normative ideals are there regardless of whether we live up to them. Right? Regardless of whether we actually achieve what we should do, we should still do it. Or still try. Right? And the argument that... We, we are bad at doing something is not an argument for not doing it. Can I, can I just ask, I, I, my, my understanding of the, um, of the position in terms of feelings was that feelings can't necessarily be trusted in terms um, to, to get you to the, to the good because sometimes your, your feelings lie to you. Um, um, so, so, the, so the role within ethics of ethical feelings, whether that's um, to act in a certain way because of, out, out of love or whether you feel revulsion at other actions. Um, your, your, your position, as I understood it, was that those feelings don't necessarily um, come, up to, come up to scratch, really, in, in, you know, in favour of reasoning. But given that we can be bad at reasoning as well, and we can misuse reasoning to, to then go and do bad acts, I'm, I'm now a little bit confused as to why we're throwing feelings away and ethical feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Because, look, I mean, at, at the end of the day, reason is the standard, right? That's why I say it's an idea, right? It's yeah. a standard against which our practice can be judged, right? And we can judge our feelings and our actual attempts at reasoning against that standard. Yeah. But if, if, if somebody acts out of love and completely irrational, just, you know, I mean, it happens all the time. Oh, yeah, but um, people, people, well, people, people, possibly not. I mean, is that not a good act? It, 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 it yeah. can be. It's not always someone could kill me out of love, but that wouldn't be a good act. At least I don't think it would. But, but um, just because feelings can lead to the right results doesn't mean that 
that we're always justified in acting on our feelings. Feel feelings can provide a very interesting and important addition to our moral framework, mm. but they've got to be situated. They can't be the basis of our moral framework. They tend to be. Yeah, uh, they tend to be, but they yeah. should. Yes. Can I just say that as a theist, can I bring in the, the, the idea of process theology, which is, <laughs> which is Whitehorn and uh, uh, Hartshead, and, and actually Hartshead. using... Have I got it wrong? Yes, well, anyway, what's that? Well. <laughs> and, and that is a kind of a way of, of using reason within a, th a theistic uh, uh, metaphor. It's not uh, something... A lot of what you've said is exceedingly dualistic, and I, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, and um, I think there's a, I find there's a need to see what, how we become who we are, how we make our choices as a process of thought and reason, even within a theistic framework. I just think that the theistic framework, as I was saying to Mike earlier, can just drop away beyond a certain point. Beyond a certain point, we just don't need it. And in fact, all it's doing is, is holding us back. Okay. Can I just suggest that, every, that history suggests everyone? Yes. Because we've yes. talked about, you know, you started with Nietzsche, you have to go on all yeah. about 1960, you have to go on all the rest of it. Actually, 2,000 years ago, Christianity came to God. <laughs> and then it spread 400 years bringing him back. Um, and philosophers have been arguing about it ever since. <laughs> But the whole, you know, if you, you, you can read the Gospels and say Jesus wanted to get rid of the metaphysical in the sense that we're oh, talking yeah. about. Uh, the kingdom of heaven was meant to be a kingdom of heaven on earth, yeah. about yes. peace and justice yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So they killed him. And then the Romans show yeah. and turned it into a big imperial thing, we stopped it all again. Well, yeah, so, it, it, it's perfectly, as I say, it's perfectly possible to make those kinds of arguments. I just, and, and, and again, I've got nothing again. Using, using religious figures to counter religion itself. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've got, I don't even have a problem with, with religious movements. I mean, as I say, I, my, my father's a Quaker, and the more I learn about Quakers, the more I think, oh, great. That's not, that's, but, that's, um, that's not meant as a critique of what you've been saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't no, know, no, I'm just putting it into the meeting. No, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. No. I, I agree. Uh, it's, yeah. I just think that, again, we can, we can have a lot of this stuff without needing to I just said that because I'm getting the impression we've gone off on one half of the discussion, which is about reason and... Yeah. and, 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 and Philosophical things, and we lost the God bit, so I'm just trying yeah. to put the God bit back in. Okay, well, whoever wants to put the God bit back in, uh, feel free. We have to start closing down, but Jack still wants to make a point. Yeah, yeah uh, one of the reasons why I, I found your talk ultimately unsatisfying is because you seem to be presenting a totally mechanistic view of, view of the human condition. You seem to be saying that the reason logic is the ultimate, and in that case, you would argue that the computer, which is perfect for use of logic, should should be uh, we should attribute ethics to a computer. Can a computer be good? Uh, it, it could be. Look, I mean, I, I'll say this. I'll say this out loud. I'm a computer. Um, I'm just a very specific kind of computer. I, I, I'm not necessarily very good. Very good at being that kind of computer, but I am. Right. So is everybody else in this room, as far as I'm concerned. It's not right. mechanistic. Being, being a, a rational agent is a species of doing a computer. Not all computers are rational agents, but some of them are. He right. means we are inherently rational. That's how we are programmed, and everything else gets in the well, way. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I, I'm not necessarily saying no. that either. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, as, as I say, I, I, what I say is, to be, to be a rational agent, to be a person, right, is to be a special kind of computer. Mm. Now, that isn't necessarily... You don't necessarily have to be very good at it. <laughs> you can be bad at being that, but, but, you can, but it's still important to be held to certain standards. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think, I think ethics comes out of a certain kind of computational idea. I think it comes out of being able to process reasons properly, right? But that's a particular kind of computation. It's not the kind of computation that my, my laptop over there is going to be doing. It's much more complicated. What's different? Huh? What's different? Uh, lots of lots of technical issues. Um, uh, but only technical. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it is. It is. It is. Like, give you a, a really, really sort of general statement. 
um, Turing, right, came up with the specification of what a computer is, which is completely abstract, which is totally independent of what you make computers out of. You can make a computer for Turing out of anything, silicon, brain matter, um, you know, a la an elaborate system of cats, mice, cheese, and gates, and whatever. You can be made out of anything. Um, I think it's possible to give a similarly abstract description of what it is to be a rational agent, right? Which, which, which doesn't specify what it's made out of. And in that sense, there can be artificial intelligence. There, can, there could be computers that we build who we would have ethical responsibilities to, and they would have ethical responsibilities to us. But, but it will not be any kind of creature similar to, to, to man. It would be functionally constructed in a similar way. It can act uh, in some cases similar to man, but never it will be the same. Because, uh, because the way of thinking is not our think is not rational. Our mind knows this. For example, pattern recognition. It didn't take into consideration at all pattern recognition. Look, I mean, I, I just think these are all extraneous. This is, this is like talking about you know, the difference between a mainframe and a, and my Macintosh computer. You know? there, are, there are different ways. But it's not logic at all. It's, it's not logic. Look, no, 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 no. It's, it's, I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, would you, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, there's also an, an inference here that uh, if you kill God, then we are all material machines. We're all mechanisms. That, that's really <laughs> what you're saying. Well, yeah. that, that's, that's the metaphysical side of it. The metaphysical yeah. side of it. Yeah, I, mean, I think we're all machines. Yes. yes. But that's necessarily related to the idea of. of it's, it's, really it's not related to the ethical side. It's related to the metaphysical side. Where is free will? Uh, free will isn't about. Free will is entirely compatible with determinism. Entirely compatible with it. In fact, if. I will make another really sweeping claim and maybe we can talk about this for the time. I think unless you are determinist, you can't think about freedom. Freedom, freedom is conditional on all determinism. Right? If you think freedom is about some weird metaphysical special quality you have, you don't understand freedom. So we can argue about that too. Uh, any last words of wisdom before we let Pete sum up? Well, I just want to say one thing. I, yeah. can, I think there's a lot of either or in this debate. In the sense that you know, either there is a God or either there is not a God. And there's a, there seems to be a stark difference between the idea that either something caused everything to happen in the first place or that everything always <coughs> happened, any, always happens. There's no more reason to say that something started everything than there is to say that everything um, always happened. And therefore, we ultimately, of both questions, we can never know. So there is a there is a sceptical position, uh, whereby we don't know either, and we cannot ever say either, and that we can think of God in terms of mystery and wonder, and the unknown, and that, in my opinion, I see reason as some a way of understanding things. It doesn't produce things, a way of understanding. It's, a, it's an analytical tool for me. You can't say but, both, but you can't yes. say that it's a god and there's not Yes, I'm, I'm just saying it, it often happens, there's polarity and people feel they have to be on one side or another and I'm just saying it's not a silly case you might think. Well, I, I think you've, you've brought up a very good issue and I'm, I'm, trying to be the, I'm, I'm trying to be more neutral on that issue. That's actually Kant's position, Kant thinks. We can't say the universe has a beginning or it doesn't yes. have a beginning. We've just got to have this kind of antinomy and then God pops in as yes. this sort of mystical yes. extra. And I, I, I again, I, I don't agree with that, but uh, I haven't entirely decided where I sit on the quest of the beginning of the universe and this that and the other. So, so I, I, in principle, I think you're, you're right. It's just I'm not trying to you know, say it. I'm not trying to hold that position. Okay, any further comments before we close? Okay, uh, Pete, the stage is yours at last. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've never left. I apologize. <laughs> um, um, right. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's lots of very, very interesting things have turned up. Um, and obviously, um, as everybody has is, is is already no noticed, um, my, my talk didn't venture into the positive. It was very much a negative. It didn't, it didn't, didn't venture in my, my alternative conception of what the ethical should be, I simply kind of said, we should have ethics without theism. Um, 
And I, I, I do think there's a story that can be told about that. And as everybody's already noticed, it heavily involves reason and it, and it involves understanding the detailed nature of practical rationality. And there are a lot of important questions about how you understand that. Some to do with the difference between the normative and the natural, and this, this difference between how we actually act and how we should act. And others to do with um, the relation between the different sides of reason. And, and what it is to talk about logic in this context. Um, what I'd like to close on is to come back to, to Jack's point, because I never actually got to address it, about the relationship between logic and reason. This is other Jack's point as well. Um, basically, I think that a big problem with a lot of thinking in the 20th century, a lot of it which comes out against reason and rationality, is that people have a, a truncated conception of what reason involves. And this is why I, at the beginning of my talk I said I'm going to be presenting myself against sort of neo-positivists who think there's nothing more to reason than science, and against neoclassical economists, economists who think there's nothing more to practical reason than instrumental reason. So I, I, I think rational choice theory has been disastrous because it's, it's encouraged people to try and develop ethical frameworks on the basis of an idea of reason that has no ethics in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, like I think that there is such a thing as genuinely collective reasoning, like reasoning about what we should do, we should do, not about just what I should do. Um, the, 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 the difficulty is to show what you would want to call the logic of that reasoning is. That reasoning has its own logical structure, what we need to do is describe it, and when we describe it, we will you will find out a lot more about ethics and how it should work. So what a lot of people think of as logic is just very, very simple first order propositional logic, you know, if P then Q mm. and P then Q. You know, there is much more to the formal structure of theoretical and practical reasoning that we can study. And we can study it in really interesting and technical detail. Um, and maybe I'll get a chance to talk about Thank you very much. Two weeks time, uh, Bill you. Lewis, I don't know if you all know him, will present his version of God. Bill Lewis. Oh, yeah.